Good evening. I know I'm the last thing that stands between you and the sumptuous meal that awaits us, so I will endeavor to be entertaining, provocative, and keep you awake with a very rapid-paced slideshow with many colors. I would also like to begin by thanking the sponsors of the conference and all the people who worked on it for organizing this tremendous event, bringing so many people together, and for inviting me to participate. My focus will be primarily on the U.S. economy, uh, and it will be a great follow-up to the two presentations you've just heard, I hope. But I will also, if I have time, briefly address the connections of the U.S. to the rest of the global economy and global stagnation issues. So to start with the question posed in my title, is it uh, a slow recovery or secular stagnation, let me immediately give you my answer. I will argue that the United States is experiencing both the slowest and weakest recovery in the last seven decades and a longer-term growth slowdown. I will argue that the slow and prolonged recoveries from the last two recessions, not only the Great Recession of 2008 to 9, but also the recession of 2001, are symptomatic of underlying structural changes that are creating a tendency towards secular stagnation in the U.S. economy, and that this tendency predates the financial crisis. I would also like to clarify, in, lo in, in light of yesterday's conversation, that in using the term secular stagnation, I mean this in a descriptive sense, that is to refer to a chronic or long-term tendency and not necessarily to associate myself with the views of any particular one of those theories, especially the ones that emanated from, from Harvard, as we heard about yesterday. Okay. Now, it is, of course, true that the United States recovered from the financial crisis of 2008 much better uh, than it did following the stock market crash of 1929. As emphasized, you, you might wonder why I'm talking about that, that's been emphasized recently in a new book by former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke and also by Jason Furman, Obama's current chief economic advisor, in a series of re recent speeches. And uh, these graphs are taken from one of uh, Furman's speeches. So it shows you the comparison of the U.S. with uh, the euro, similar to what Paul de Grove showed you. Um, and it also shows you the comparison of the United States in the most recent period with the post-1929 Great Depression. Now, the fact that the United States avoided another Great Depression is no small accomplishment. Nonetheless, avoiding a deep depression could be considered a low standard for modern economic performance. And it does not preclude the possibility that we have entered into a period of chronically lower, a, a chronically lower trend rate of growth. It is also true that the U.S. has recovered more quickly and fully uh, than Europe or other advanced economies. And however, the data in this chart show that Europe and Japan have generally grown more slowly than the U.S., not only since 2008, but for the entire period since the early 1990s. And Europe's uh, problems in the most recent period are largely self-inflicted, as both uh, one of the previous speakers and several other people at the conference have, have argued. But when we look at the U.S. economy in terms of its own historical performance, we see a much bleaker picture. The current recovery and expansion phase is the weakest since 1981. And I know you'll say, well, we haven't gotten to the peak yet, and that's true. Uh, but we're getting there very slowly, and this cycle is already actually longer than the previous one, and almost as long as the ones in the 90s and, and, and the 80s. Uh, in fact, each business cycle since the 1980s has exhibited slower growth in the recovery and expansion phases than the one before it. The next two slides compare the most recent recovery with the previous post-war recessions in the United States. First for output, that's this one, and for employment. And I'm going to focus mainly on this one. But what each of these graphs show for output and employment is the cumulative percentage change in the variable from its previous peak level for each recession. 
Clearly, in terms of either output or employment, the post-2008 recession was deeper and the subsequent re recovery was slower than in any of the earlier ones shown. But if you look at these two charts in more time than I know you have time to, so I'll tell you what they say, they show that the last three recoveries have been slower and more prolonged in terms of employment than in terms of output. So you see the three most recent uh, recoveries, very slow and prolonged in terms of employment, they were very minor. You could hardly see them on the GDP chart. In the current recovery, it took four and a half years for GDP to recover to its previous peak, but it took more than six years for employment to return to its pre-recession level. The worsening performance of employment compared with output is not simply a matter of employment being a lagging indicator in the business cycle, although it is. The slower recovery of employment in the three most recent cycles is also symptomatic of a deeper malaise affecting the job market. During the 1980s and 90s, total employment grew at an average annual rate of about 2 million jobs. Since 2001, however, the average annual increase in employment is only about 650,000 jobs. Thus, the stagnation in employment began seven years before the financial crisis. Similarly, the real income of the median household began to grow more slowly as far back as the 1970s and has been trending downward since 2000. So at this point, I would like to turn to the causes of slower long-term growth, starting with the demand side. A prime culprit in the weakening of aggregate demand is the worsening inequality in the US society, which has been seen in a number of dimensions, including larger gaps between more and less educated workers, a falling labor share of national income, and a widening of gaps in the personal or household distribution of income. One very important uh, driver of widening inequality is the slower growth of real wages and benefits compared to labor productivity. Real hourly compensation closely tracked output per hour until the 1970s, but has grown at a much lower rate than productivity since then. As a result, there has been a tendency for the labor share of national income to decline, although this tendency did not uh, appear until somewhat later because of issues related to price indexes that I don't have time to go into now. Uh, but this index of the nominal labor share, so it doesn't have any uh, inflation adjustments, but it, it's the, the best measure, shows the standard stylized fact of cyclical variations along a roughly constant trend up until the 1990s, but the labor share has declined very sharply since 2000, and I indicate a few of the key events here. Turning to the personal distribution of income, family income tended to increase at roughly equal rates for all quintiles during the period 1947 to 79. Since then, however, the changes have been entirely in a disequalizing direction as the growth rates have been higher in each quintile compared with the one below it and highest for the top 5%. And finally, I know everybody has seen the Piketty data. Uh, we're all familiar with a tremendous increase in the uh, income shares of the top 1% and the top one hundredth of 1% in the United States since the 1970s. Now based on Keynesian or Koletskian theory, such increasing inequality would be expected to have a depressing effect on consumption, which is the largest component of aggregate demand. And numerous empirical studies by many people in this audience and others have confirmed that consumption is in fact uh, positively related to the wage share in the US and almost all countries. Evidence on the impact of rising household inequality has been harder to come by. Uh, some other people here have worked on that. Uh, but the cross-sectional data clearly support higher consumption to income ratios in the lower income brackets. And Barry Cinnamon and Steve Fazari have shown that if you correct the US national income accounts for certain uh, bizarre things they do in the measurement of consumption and income, and if you look at what households actually spend on uh, both real actual consumer goods and services and housing, that in fact it does correlate very strongly and uh, with, uh, with uh, income levels. But of course, as we well know, U.S. consumption expenditures remain quite robust throughout the 1990s and up until the financial crisis in 2007. According to an argument that should be well known in this audience, the negative impact of widening inequality on consumption was mitigated in the late 90s and early 2000s 
by various financial bubbles and massive increases in household debt, which permitted middle class families to increase their spending in spite of stagnant incomes. I believe this argument is familiar to most of you, so I could cover it briefly. This slide shows the tremendous increase in household debt as a percentage of disposable income in the 1990s and early 2000s, most of which was in uh, mortgages. And the next chart shows you the bubble in real housing prices, which climbed by 60% up in the decade up to 2006 when it peaked uh, and then cratered thereafter. This uh, debt and uh, housing bubble-led uh, boom uh, was, of course, unsustainable. And the financial crisis and the subsequent deleveraging ended the ability of US households to sustain high levels of consumption and expenditures on housing via borrowing. But while we're on the demand side, you may be wondering, if productivity grew faster than wages and the labor share fell, surely profitability must have increased. And if so, wouldn't that have created compensating increases in investment? In fact, the profit share value added has risen sharply since 2000, but the share of gross business fixed investment in GDP has trended downward since that time. Oh, sorry, wrong chart. That one. Profit share trending upward since 2000, investment rate actually trending slightly downward. Of course, um, investment does follow profitability in terms of short-run cyclical fluctuations with some lags, but the longer-term trends have been moving in opposite directions. Moreover, this weakening of investment has occurred despite interest rates that are at record lows, as well as profits that are at record highs. Evidently, firms are responding mostly to the lack of demand growth in making their investment decisions, which shows that strong accelerator effects dominate in the investment function over profitability or cost of capital factors, especially in the long run. Housing investment, which is normally more sensitive to interest rates, has only recovered to levels that would have been uh, typical of a recession previously. The still depressed level of house construction, of course, is partly a, a, a reflection of the severity of a financial crisis in which the housing sector was the epicenter. But these data, combined with those on business investment, show the weak impact of monetary policies, both conventional and quantitative easing, that have been the main instrument uh, for stimulating or attempting to stimulate the economy since 2008. Those policies may have helped to rescue the financial sector and prevent a more severe depression, but have failed to engineer a more re robust recovery of investment. Before we leave, I'm going to skip one thing because I'm sure I'm behind, behind in time. Before we leave the demand side, we need to ask whether fiscal policy has stepped up to compensate for the relatively ineffective monetary stimulus in a period when short-term interest rates have been at the lower bound. The answer, of course, and unfortunately, is no. Of course, automatic fiscal stabilizers have continued to operate, as seen in the sharp rise in the US budget deficit in 2008 and 9. But only small and short-lived fiscal stimulus policies were adopted under both the Bush and Obama administrations, although the Obama stimulus was somewhat larger. The rise in the fiscal deficit, however, led to a political reaction, I think similar to what we've heard about in other cases, uh, that brought, in the American case, ultra-conservative Republicans into a dominant position in the Congress. Since 2011, as a result, they have engineered a series of artificial legislative crises, which they have used to force deep reductions in federal spending. As a result of the sequester and other budget cuts, reduced government spending has been putting a severe fiscal drag on the economy for the past four years. In fact, the present recovery is the only recent one in which real government spending was cut below its pre-recession level at a time when the recovery was far from complete. But I would be remiss if I left you with the impression that the causes of stagnation tendencies in the US economy lie only on the demand side. Also, if inequality is a key factor, uh, as I have argued, the increase in inequality, in inequality itself needs to be explained. A full analysis of the causes of rising inequality would be beyond the scope of this panel or my time limit. But there are certain structural changes in the US economy that have been important contributing factors, not only to the rise of inequality, but also especially to why employment and wages have been doing so badly 
in the last few decades. The most relevant structural change in this regard is the decline in the uh, manufacturing share of GDP and the rise of the service sector. The falling share of manufacturers has been driven in part by a worsening trade deficit in manufactured goods and the vertical disintegration of manufacturing production, the offshoring of intermediate goods and assembly operations to lower wage locations, as well as profound technological changes. The U.S. trade deficit in manufacturers has reached about 35 percent of domestic value added in the manufacturing sector uh, in the past decade. It's been coming down for the last 35 years. This transformation of the U.S. manufacturing sector has had a two-sided effect on labor markets and inequality. On the one hand, it puts downward pressure on wages, especially because most of the growth in manufactured imports has come from lower wage countries such as China and Mexico, along with other developing and emerging market nations. On the other hand, the offshoring of manufacturing jobs has contributed to the decline in employment in this sector, which has fallen by 7 million, or about 40 percent, since 2001. Because manufacturing jobs tend to pay better than jobs in other sectors on average, it is mainly high-wage employment that has been reduced as manufacturing shrinks. In addition, there are two other ways in which the rise of the service sector as a share of GDP has contributed to weakening the employment, out, imp, the employment impact of output growth. In regard to business cycles, as argued by Martha Olney and Aaron Pasitti in a recent paper, a growing proportion of service industries implies a slower recovery of employment after a recession for two reasons. First, uh, service producers don't need to restock inventories after a, a recession, as goods producers do, and also many services are non-tradable so that you don't get a boost from exports uh, in the recovery as you do for goods. Second, in the longer term, Dupankar Basu and Duncan Foley have pointed out that all service industries are not equivalent. Some services have measurable value added, and these sectors create jobs in some proportion to the value added reported in the national income accounts. But other services don't have measurable value added, and instead their output is imputed in the national income accounts based on income received and is not closely related to the amount of employment generated. This is especially problematic for uh, one of the largest sectors, finance, insurance, and real estate, known often as FIRE, uh, which we're playing with, I guess, uh, where certainly the income is not uh, closely related to, to employment. But these services that don't produce measurable value added now account for more than half of GDP as it is officially measured. And when output in these sectors grow, this is more than half the economy, you don't necessarily get employment gains the way you do in manufacturing or other goods production. Before I conclude, assuming I'm not in a terrible time deficit, I would like to say a few words about how the U.S. economic slowdown is likely to impact on the global economy. A few of my Brazilian friends here will remember uh, this picture from two years ago in Sao Paulo. Um, before the 2008 crisis, global growth was being sustained by a triangular pattern of trade imbalances, financial flows, and demand transmission among three groups of countries. The deficit countries or demand generators, the manufacturing exporters, and the primary commodity exporters. This diagram shows in a schematic, and I admit overly simplified way, um, how the deficit countries, led by the US and, and a, a few others, have provided net flows of demand for the exports of the two groups of surplus countries, either directly or indirectly. Of course, I'm well aware there are also reciprocal demand flows in the opposite directions between these different groups, and there are important flows and imbalances within these groups, as you all know very well in Europe. And we also have that in North America and in Asia. But the point of this schematic representation is to emphasize the flows of net excess demand stemming from the deficits and borrowing of the main demand-generating countries. During the boom uh, before the crisis of 2007, 8, 9, 
the manufacturing exporters as well as the resource exporters ultimately relied on debt-driven household demand from the deficit nations to support their export-led growth. Excuse me. The fallacy in this strategy is that it ultimately weakens the very source of its own dynamic by undermining employment and incomes in the deficit nations that in the final instance generate the demand. For the reasons I've been explaining uh, this evening, the United um, States is not likely to be as strong a generator of global demand in the foreseeable future as it was before 2008. Using the, the current account deficit as a measure of the net demand impulse that the U.S. imparts to the rest of the world, we could see that this deficit has decreased to about 2 or 3 percent of GDP in the last few years, only about half as much as before the crisis. The U.S. current account deficit has been reduced partly because of weak uh, domestic demand and also because the trade deficit in manufacturers, which we saw as enormous, has been partly offset by increased uh, surpluses in services and investment income. But these smaller U.S. current account deficits imply less transmission of demand stimulus to the rest of the world. Therefore, to avoid sustained global deflationary pressures, the surplus countries, uh, some of which we've heard about today, will have to generate more of their own demand, both internally and reciprocally, and not rely so much on the U.S. or other deficit countries to be the, the locomotives of growth for the world economy. To summarize, I have argued that the U.S. economy is currently locked into a trajectory that implies a tendency, notice that's italicized, towards secular stagnation as a result of the following factors, all of which are closely interrelated. The underlying weakness of household demand, primarily due to stagnant wages and increasing inequality. Structural changes leading to reduced employment generation in proportion to output growth and a shrinkage of high wage manufacturers. Weak private sector domestic investment in spite of record profits and low or zero interest rates. Political gridlock and the imposition of austerity and fiscal policy and the reverberations from the slowdowns in other countries, uh, especially the Euro area and the resource exporters, which are major destinations for U.S. exports. I will conclude, though, with one note of caution. I must note the difference between identifying a tendency toward secular stagnation and making a prediction that it will actually occur or continue to occur. I learned this lesson the hard way because the last time I predicted U.S. stagnation in print was in a book chapter I published in 1994, right before the information technology boom of the late 1990s <laughs> took off. The lesson, of course, is that any prediction must be conditional on the absence of counteracting forces. So looking to the future, what possible forces could arise to offset this tendency which I, I have identified? There are many possibilities. I will just mention two of them now. First, we cannot discard the possibility of a new financial bubble or debt-led spending boom occurring. Indeed, the stock market has risen strongly in spite of the weakness of the recovery in the real economy. House prices have recovered significantly, as you saw in an earlier uh, chart. And we should not underestimate, we should not underestimate the ingenuity of Wall Street or the short memories of lenders, borrowers, and policymakers. Of course, any new boom of this type would not be any more sustainable than the previous ones based on bubbles and debt, uh, but it could happen again uh, in some new form. Second, in spite of the current wave of anti-government ideology in the right wing in US politics, I see in certain current trends, like the campaign of Bernie Sanders, the possibility of a new consensus arising around the need for an enhanced role of the public sector. A new program of fiscal expansion could be focused on infrastructure investment, solar and wind energy, education, research and development, and other important social and environmental needs. Alternatively, alternatively however, depending on the politics and global conditions, 
we could potentially see fiscal expansion in the form of a new military buildup. I hope it will not be the latter. But in any case, no kind of fiscal expansion will make a dent in inequality unless it creates a sustained period of high employment, leading to a recovery of wages. That's my <laughs> timer. I think I'm definitely uh, out of time. So I'll lend myself one minute of deficit uh, spending here. Uh, no kind of fiscal expansion will make a dent in inequality unless it creates a sustained period of high employment leading to a recovery of wages relative to productivity and unless action is taken to offset the structural changes that have fostered greater inequality and jobless growth. Thank you.